Welcome to CVSA's August virtual presentation, Finding and Maintaining Your Mental Health with CVS in the Middle of COVID-19. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Debbie Conklin. If you have contacted the office in the last four years, you have talked to me as I have been the program director since June of 2016. My involvement with CVSA started with organizing the Run for the Bucket in Wisconsin shortly after my son's CVS diagnosis in 2005. In 2007, I joined the CDSA Board of Directors, and then in 2016, I became the Program Director. And now for the main attraction. We would like to welcome Dr. Karen Cassidy as this month's presenter. Dr. Karen Cassidy is a lively sought after speaker and commentator on national media such as Nightline, The Today Show, Animal Planet, The Joy Behar Show, Huffington Post, Public Radio, and many more. She is the past president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and the founder of the Anxiety Treatment Center of Greater Chicago and Moms Without Worry, a program that helps mothers overcome the social and cultural pressure to be perfect and to raise perfect kids. She enjoys using her expertise to help families overcome anxiety and mood disorders and the dilemmas of parenting in a high stress digital world. She experienced a mild version of CVS as a child and has two sons with who had severe CDS. She especially enjoys helping others become their better selves with authenticity, joy, and good humor. I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Karen Cassidy. I met Karen Cass Dr. Karen Cassidy at the, one of the first uh, Wisconsin Run Walks, and so I'm happy to uh, engage with her again. Please help me welcome Dr. Karen Cassidy. Saved my emotional life. Um, and I cannot thank Dr. Lee and the CVSA enough because I, there were times where I felt like I was, didn't know whether to pray for my son to die, to stop his suffering or to carry on. And when I learned that there were possibilities and hope, it changed my prayers into ones of optimism. So let's talk about what puts people at risk for anxiety disorders. And the reason I'm talking about anxiety disorders is that if you have cyclic vomiting, then one of the comorbid conditions or mental health conditions you are most at risk for is to have an anxiety disorder. We know that genetically those run together along with running together with migraine disorders. And so I want you to listen up and learn as much as you can so that you can do wonderful things to help your mental wellness or those of your children if you're listening here on their behalf. So the first thing we know is that in the general population before the pandemic happened, about 23 to 25% of people in any country met diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder. So that's what we see in the population is around a quarter of us will have a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And that's a pretty large percentage. And the thing that a lot of people don't know is anxiety disorders are more prevalent than depression, than mood disorders, than substance abuse. They are the big one. They just don't get the same press as the other disorders. And then since the pandemic, what we've seen is an increase and unfortunately, when they've done um, really good studies in China and Scandinavia and Western Europe, and then here in the United States, we're seeing those prevalence rates go up to 30 to 40%, okay? So almost doubling. And then when we've done surveys of Americans who are 18 and older, we see that 50% say that their mental health has been impaired, particularly with anxiety, since the start of the pandemic. Um, and then the other thing that we see when we look at these studies is the people who are most impaired are people who are younger. Um, and that is something that is alarming. So we're seeing the younger you are, if you're a young adult, if you're a teenager, you're in your 30s, you're much more likely to have difficulty with this than say if you were in your 50s or 60s or 70s. And then another thing that we see happening is that before the pandemic happened, um, over the last 30 years, we've seen an increase in anxiety disorders and depression amongst the millennial population and younger, so mid-30s and younger. And we believe that there have been some cultural changes in how we think about distress, how we um, raise children, 
that have been accidentally decreasing the general mental resilience and grittiness of the population that have been making it harder. And so having those things happen and then the pandemic happens on top of it, it is a powder keg in terms of mental health. Um, one of the reasons that we think this is happening is we know if you look at genetics, we see that about 40% of the population are at increased risk to develop anxiety disorders. And what we see now that we've been able to um, look at the gene code and at things that go along with that is what people are transmitting genetically are several things. So one is an ability to learn under conditions of fear much faster where it only takes one bad episode and then the person starts dreading and physically over responding. Another thing we see that's inherited is the, uh, the ability of the body to settle is impaired and it gets aroused too quickly under conditions of stress and has a very hard time settling. And we know that a subset of the population of people with CVS has dysautonomias where their autonomic nervous system is impaired. And that of course goes along with this. And then another thing we see is that if you expose people to trauma, only 40% are going to get post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you think about that, that's actually pretty amazing because when I was in graduate school in the 90s, we believed that you just had to give people enough stress, enough trauma, and they would all get PTSD. Well, the truth is about 60% of us are the lucky ones um, where we're just naturally more resilient. Our autonomic nervous system that's responsible for that flight, fight, or freeze is more stable. Um, we just are... Um, come out of the womb more resilient. The problem is if you have cyclic vomiting disorder, then unfortunately you know you're less likely to be in that 60% of the population. You are, have a high probability of being in that 40% that's at high risk. So let's go to the next slide and let's talk a little bit about the specific risk factors for cyclic vomiting. So we know that um, CVS, is comorbid with anxiety disorders. That's a known fact. And then also, this used to happen to my kids, is that when you have CVS and you get any viral illness or bacterial infection, then that can trigger it. And you know, my family used to joke about this and say, you know, all roads lead to cyclic vomiting. If my kid, when they're in their bad state, if they got a cold, if they got the flu, if they got anything, then it meant weeks and weeks of cyclic vomiting and trying to get that back under control. And so this is one thing that's really tough if you're a CVSer and then you're trying to shelter and trying to avoid contamination with people that could be carrying COVID, then you are creating a condition of chronic stress and chronic alertness and arousal that unfortunately is going to start wearing down your nervous system and make it easier to get anxious and to get CVS. And then the other problem is the shelter in place thing means that you have even fewer opportunities to do the things that create great social support. And probably one of the biggest lessons we've learned here from the quarantine is that, you know, the fantasy of that online digital life is not all it's cracked up to be. And that we need face-to-face -face and skin-to-skin -skin contact with other human beings in order to stay really well. And if you're someone where you're sequestered periodically because of your CVS episodes, and then you have this, you know, addition of the stressor of you're just not allowed to see people the same way, then you're creating additional stress and social deprivation that's going to up your risk for developing anxiety and depression. And so it's, it's a really tough situation for people to manage. And I'm trying to explain this to you to say why, um, if you or your kid are having trouble with anxiety or depression right now, it's not because you have defects in your personality or coping, it's because the circumstances have made it even harder to cope well at the times that you can. So let's go to the next slide. So I want you, when you look at this slide, just to tell me which image grabbed your attention first. And if you're like research, it's going to be the skull and crossbones, even though that image of the beautiful mountain scene is gorgeous and one that really ought to rivet your attention because of its beauty. 
And one of the things that is interesting about the human brain is that we are hardwired to pay attention to negative information and to fear provoking information. And we can't help it. We can change it. And later on, I'm going to be talking about ways that we can change that orientation and shift it toward things that are positive and hopeful and uplifting. But if we don't do anything to change that, we are going to notice negative and catastrophic and fear-provoking information first. And research would also dictate that at the end of this presentation, when you think about it, you'll remember this slide more easily than all the others. Well, here's how this plays out during the pandemic. Um, media outlets know that attention-grabbing headlines are fear-provoking headlines. And I remember seeing at the early pandemic, you do have you know, one of these um, news outlets that prides itself on being scientific and would say, um, doctors are studying um, you know, various uh, risk factors for uh, COVID-19. And then you'd see another headline that say, thousands of people predicted to die because doctors don't yet understand COVID-19. And they were then both citing the same research. Well, when we hear that information, we remember it, and it starts to change our perception and make it even more selective for dangerous information or fear-confirming information. And it's kind of like we get in a funnel and it gets more and more confining in terms of what we seek out. And then another thing that is difficult about how we're hardwired is we have something called the attribution bias. And the attribution bias, it states that when um, something bad happens to ourselves, we explain it according to circumstance. So let's say I was late to this presentation. What I would do is I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. The traffic was so bad here in the Chicago area, and I just couldn't get to my computer. And, um, and I would say it that way. On the other hand, let's say you were late to the presentation what I would be saying in my head if I didn't know about and combat the attribution bias is you guys were all bad people and lazy and not paying attention to your schedule and you ought to get yourselves together. Well, one of the problems with this is if you're hardwired to look at negative things and you're hardwired to say there's a bad reason that other people are not doing things that make me feel safe or make me feel comfortable then you're going to be looking at the world as though it's a more and more dangerous place, a place you can't trust, people you can't trust, and you're going to just get yourself into a mental, um, mentally ill stew, I guess is the best way to put it. And so we have to learn to combat those two biases if we're going to be truly mentally well. So let's go. Oh, and then one other thing I want to let you know that is also interesting is we always trust personal information, information that we have seen ourselves or experienced over scientific information. So let's say how this plays out. Let's say, for example, you happen to know someone who got very ill from COVID and died or nearly died. And this um, means you're more likely to perceive yourself as being in extreme danger and everyone else is being very dangerous. On the other hand, if you don't know anyone who has personally experienced COVID and you're only reading about it in the news, then you're not gonna feel in um, personal danger the same way. And you're gonna feel like, what's the big fuss? Why is everybody so bent out of shape in New York City? You know, here in the Midwest, it's no big deal. Um, and it has to do with, we tend to trust the stuff that we experience over anything that's scientific or useful. And all of this can make us mentally ill if we're not aware of it and trying to do something about it. So let's go to the next slide. So I wanna ask you, everybody be honest with yourselves. You don't have to raise a hand on Zoom here. How many of you have gotten righteous, righteously mad or indignant about people not wearing masks or about people forcing you to wear masks? And I'm gonna bet some of you, if you're honest, are gonna say yes to that. Well, fear oftentimes makes us angry, and you've heard of the fight, flight, or freeze response. 
Well, one of the responses we get that people forget about is when we get mad, when we're anxious, we start attacking and we start diminishing those other people and it heightens our sense of danger. And um, anxiety is very activating, it energizes us. And so if you're that kind of person that easily gets mad and righteous, it means you're going into the fight response of the fight, flight, or freeze. And that is actually not very helpful because the truth is everyone's right. Everyone has reasons, good reasons for why they think the way they do. If you don't know anyone who's gotten sick, and you're really into your personal freedom, and you have no personal experience seeing the illness, you are gonna be less likely to believe that people ought to wear masks all the time. If you're a science junkie like I am, where I've learned to trust that, then it's much easier for me to go along with that at the start of the pandemic when I don't know anyone who has had any problems with it. I believe what I'm seeing in the news. Let's go to the next slide. And this, is about the freeze response. And this is one that a lot of us have experienced during the pandemic. And it's where we get indecisive. And we keep trying to research more information. You know, what's the right kind of mask to wear? You know, should I have an N95 or an N100? Um, if my kid or I'm outdoors and there's no one around, should I be wearing a mask? Or um, do I only put it on if I see, you know, can see people, um, you know, uh, so what exactly happens at six feet? What if someone sneezes? And this freeze response is a real problem for people because you get stuck in indecision and you can't move forward. And I've seen you know, uh, patients and other people where they're just over-researching everything all the time and then feeling like they can't move ahead with their life. And right now, a good example would be I have quite a few families I'm working with where their school is offering, um, you know, a hybrid way of coming back to school where there's some time in the school and sometimes out, and they can't decide whether or not they should do this, whether or not it's the right thing to do for their family and the particular risk factors they have. And the same is going to be true for you. If you have a kid with cyclic vomiting or you have it about when do I return to work? And the truth is, what we see is good for mental health is you have to take risks, that you can't live a life that has no risks. You have to decide which ones are reasonable. And the truth is what we're seeing with the data in terms of uh, decreasing mental health is that we need to take mental wellness factors into consideration and be addressing that and not only worry about physical safety. And uh, this is one thing I know my sons taught me um, in terms of their cyclic vomiting when for both of them came a time where they're like, I wanna go to summer camp. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what happens if they get a huge old episode there? And you know, what am I gonna do? And with my oldest, he would also get projectile pooping along with projectile vomiting. And so if you're a middle schooler, um, that's pretty tough. And Ultimately, I decided I'm going to send them because it's better for them to live life. And if the worst happens, how bad is it really? Uh, we know how to, you know, rein in cyclic vomiting by that point. Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and this is the flight response or the avoidance response. And so I'm gonna ask you this, how many of you are at this point afraid to go back to work uh, if you have a job? Um, afraid to go to school? Afraid to have your kids return to school? Um, how many of you haven't formed a pandemic pod? Because quite frankly, for our mental health right now, we all need pandemic pods where we have people where we can be together unmasked and touch and hug and physically enjoy each other's presence um, yeah, we've gone one slide too far, Debbie. There, yeah, got it, the fleeing one. Yeah, the flight response. And, um, and that we're seeing that is necessary for mental health. And you've gotta remember, Amnesty International considers um, isolation to be a cruel and unusual form of punishment and con uh, condemns it in prisons worldwide. Well, we don't wanna accidentally do that to ourselves. And we have to remember digital life is not quite 
as good as um, life online. And then the other thing that we see is um, when someone is in the flight response, they can be stuck just living at home. And so I have people where they're ordering everything online, they're not venturing out for anything, they haven't gone for a walk, they're just you know, doing laps in their house or on a treadmill or a stationary cycle and um, everything is on Amazon. And quite frankly, as a mental health professional, that is not good. Um, and these are people where they don't have some terrible immune disorder. And even if they did, we'd still want to be doing some kind of moving about and reclaiming some of your environment in a socially distanced, masked kind of way. So let's go to the next slide. So negative reinforcement is what happens when you do any kind of quick escape from something that makes you scared without naturally letting your anxiety come down on its own. And in this cartoon, we have an illustration of it. Um, another great example that everyone is familiar with is if you have a tantruming baby or toddler, and every time they tantrum, you give them a bottle of milk or a cookie, then you're gonna have two things happening. You're gonna have a kid that cries a lot more and a lot louder, and you're gonna be handing out a lot of cookies and bottles. Well, anxiety is like that toddler or that infant that is demanding more and more in terms of fight, flight, or freeze. And we know that um, you know, this can be difficult because I can remember when um, the quarantine was over in my area and they're saying, okay, it's safe to return to stores, feeling just a little nervous. And I wasn't you know, intellectually thinking this was a danger to do. It's just I had spent six weeks indoors, not being around people other than my little pandemic pod. And because I come from a long line of anxious people, it just set up some negative, accidental negative reinforcement. And it also is the same thing that happened when my oldest son um, was at the point where we we're trying to return him to school where we would stabilized his cyclic vomiting after a you know, nine month hellish period. And what would happen is I'd drive to school and a quarter of the way there, he'd vomit, he'd start crying, saying, I'm too anxious, I can't do it. And so every day we'd drive a little farther until we got him to school and we were doing exposure therapy. And even though he was crying and refusing, I would just shove him in the car because I knew I needed to stop the negative reinforcement of just staying at home and not believing that he could do more than he believed he could do. Um, another thing that's tough is that negative reinforcement makes us seek reassurance. And a lot of times people think of this as being um, thoughtful and scientific when they do more research or they compare with other people. What are you doing? How are you doing it? They look for more articles. And healthy research is where you're doing it to find information. Unhealthy reassurance seeking is where you're doing it to curb anxiety. You're trying to make sure of the facts. Well, the truth is, in the pandemic right now, we're still finding out the facts, and we don't have anything that's perfectly certain. And the other truth, having lived with cyclic vomiting myself and for my two sons, is, you know, there's never a guarantee about whether or not it's going to be a perfectly easy time or something could happen with cyclic vomiting. You do your best and it's sort of like a crapshoot sometimes. And the trick is to learn to go ahead anyway. And this negative reinforcement can get us really stuck and it can make us very rigid. And particularly for those who suffer with cyclic vomiting, it can make you pick a goal that is unrealistic, which is I can only socialize. I can only be at work. I can only be at school. I can only do stuff if I feel good. Well, that's not realistic. The truth is, if you didn't have cyclic vomiting, there are plenty of things you do if you didn't feel good. And what we've seen in terms of clinical work with people with cyclic vomiting is part of the recovery is getting back into your life. And this needs to happen during the pandemic, even though it's the pandemic, because life is too precious to spend it on negative reinforcement. Um, the other thing you need to know that's really tough about our brain uh, is that our brain is kind of stupid. When we feel imagined fear, such as watching a movie, 
or thinking about something scary that will happen or how we might throw up if we're out on this date or if we um, go to this overnight or if we return to work, our brain reacts the same as if it was a true scary situation. And it's what makes roller coasters thrilling for people. It's what sustains the um, horror movie industry or books that have scary scenes. The dilemma is, if you're not aware of that, then it means when you feel a surge of anxiety, you're going to mistake it for a strong signal that says, freeze, avoid, or fight. And you're going to misinterpret that false evidence as appearing real. And so the acronym F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real, is really apt for you to remember. And it means that one of the things that you're going to have to do is to learn to pay attention to the context and say, just because I'm scared doesn't mean something bad has happened. Just because I can imagine the bad thing or feel it in my body doesn't mean that I am really in danger. So let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about intolerance of uncertainty. So I'm gonna guess there's some of you in the audience who can identify with these shoppers. And these people, of course, are hoarding supplies at the start of the quarantine during the pandemic. And what happens when you have intolerance of uncertainty is that you work hard to get rid of that uncertainty by only focusing on the range of what's the worst case scenario. And this is one thing that people with anxiety disorders tend to do is they feel like better safe than sorry. I'll pay attention to the scary things and try and solve those problems. Well, the dilemma when you do that, if you are intolerant of uncertainty, is when you think about those scary things that make you feel scared. And then if you take actions such as buying off all the toilet paper and paper towels and hand sanitizer and masks, like um, many of my patients and friends did, that action makes you feel like you're actually doing something productive and it confirms the fear and the idea that, yeah, I'm, I'm being smart, I'm being responsible, I'm taking care of things, when actually there wasn't a real problem to start with. And this intolerance of certainty, you can tell you have it if you're one of those people that did hoard things just in case. If you're one of those people where you don't like surprises. So I have patients who tell me I hate um, birthday parties and surprise parties. I want to know ahead of time. I've had patients tell me I would rather have the doctor call and just give me my results and tell me I have cancer than wait another day because I hate the uncertainty so much. And we know that if you have intolerance of uncertainty, you are at extremely high risk to develop chronic worry. Um, these two go hand in hand, and uh, worriers have the highest level of intolerance of uncertainty of anyone in the population. And the dilemma with this is that every time you do reassurance seeking by researching just to make sure, buying things just to make sure, carrying lots and lots of extra supplies more than most people do to just make sure just in case you, you vomit, then you're gonna increase your fear about the bad things happening. And you're gonna lose mental flexibility and not be able to think of all the good possibilities that could happen. And that's the saddest part there is if you give in to this urge to worry and seek reassurance, by hoarding and reassurance seeking, then you lose your ability to think about good things. And one of the things that's very common if you're stuck in this worried state is other people will experience you as being very negative. And you'll experience yourself as being very negative. And the problem with worries is oftentimes they believe they're being smart. You know, I'm being a good parent. It's a mother's job to worry. It's, um, I remember my grandpa saying it's a father's job to worry. And when we lived in Europe when I was a kid, he would call and tell us to not drink the water. And I'm sure during World War I, when he was young, it wasn't safe to drink the water, but in the 60s and 70s, it was totally safe. <laughs> um, but he was paying crazy fees to warn us, not because we needed a warning, but to decrease his own anxiety. Um, so let's talk about, let's go to the next slide, okay? Here we go. And talk about another risk factor that we have to pay attention to in terms of anxiety. 
we know that inflammation plays a very significant role in our mental health. So it's not just something that's behind cardiovascular problems, cancers, uh, diabetes, stuff like that. We now know that the higher your levels of inflammation, the worse your mental health will be. And we also see that it may be a risk factor for autism or autistic spectrum disorders if there's high levels of inflammation in the mother and then in the infant. Um, so we know for sure that you wanna keep inflammation down. And there's three ways, quick ways that you can reduce inflammation. So number one is to eat a diet that is low on the food chain. And the best is a whole food plant-based diet with as little added fat and as little meats, poultry, and um, you know, uh, what fish as you can have. And that can rapidly reduce inflammation. And the dilemma here for a lot of us is I remember times where I'd be like, you know, what the heck can I get my kid to eat? And we would end up resorting to having, you know, basically junk food, uh, milkshakes. And I'm gonna challenge you to try and come up with nutritious alternatives where you're trying to avoid refined carbohydrates and adding healthy things like nut butters um, or uh, you know, in order to increase the fat, avocado, it can make a milkshake incredibly creamy and delicious. Uh, and so, and if you go online and you look up vegan recipes, whole food plant-based, low inflammation diet, FODMAP diet, all of that, you can find ways to feed yourself or your kid in a way that's healthy that's gonna help you and your mental health. The second one is exercise. And we see that if you do regular exercise, it is so wonderfully good for helping to reduce inflammation. And we also know that exercise is so powerful that we now know that if you can get depressed people and anxious people to exercise every day for an average of five to six days a week, trying to do 40 to 45 minutes. And we're not talking hard exercise. We're talking walking, moving around, yoga. It kind of doesn't matter what it is. It's just moving more um, than you normally do. Then we can eliminate the need for medication or greatly reduce the need for medication after a month. So only 30 days. So exercise. So that means you want to become a mover. And I know when I used to work with Dr. Lee, we were always looking at ways to try and increase my kids' fitness because the more you lose it, the easier it is than for stress to make, you know, upset the apple cart. And the third thing is sleep. Sleep helps reduce inflammation. And this is tough, of course, if you're having an episode and you're in so much pain, you can't sleep. But it means when you can control it, that you really pay attention to sleeping well and following that plan. And especially, this is tough to get across to young adults um, and to you know, help create the environment. And so I'm gonna tell you, if you're a parent, one thing we did up through high school until someone graduated is cell phones got parked in the parent's bedroom at night and we shut off the modem. And so we made it as hard as possible for our kids to be able to do anything after 10 p.m. that required a digital device. And uh, that really helped things in terms of sleep. And I know we were seen as the you know, very cruel and uncool parents, but I know that it was really good for my kids' mental and physical health. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, let's talk about agoraphobia or you might have heard the word agoraphobia. And this is where someone is afraid to do something because they might get an anxiety attack. Um, it literally means fear of the marketplace, but people can be afraid to um, go outside because what if I had an anxiety attack and I couldn't get back to a safe place? Um, afraid of crowds, um, that's not so much a problem now in terms of the pandemic. Um, anything that might trigger an anxiety attack. And we have seen increases in agoraphobia now during the pandemic. And what we know is that the best treatment for this is exposure-based therapy. And I'm gonna explain that in a bit on how to do that. But if you're afraid to do things or your kid's afraid to do things because they might get anxious, then we call that agoraphobia. And a panic attack, just for you to know, is where you have four or more physical symptoms of anxiety, such as increased heart rate, 
increased uh, respiration, sweating, cold chills, um, butterflies in your stomach, shakiness, feeling unreal, feeling depersonalized. So if you get a rapid onset, that's a panic attack. If you have three symptoms or less, we just call it an anxiety attack. Um, and if you have a full panic attack, it means you're having a more severe response. But an anxiety attack is significant just the same. Let's go to the next slide. Germophobia. Okay. This we're seeing a lot of uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, and, and I'll give you some descriptions if you're not immediately imagining this. So this is the person uh, where I had to take an airplane to Tucson to visit my elderly parents. And I uh, saw someone who had triple masks, um, a hoodie, a face mask, um, medical gloves followed by Playtex living gloves, and some kind of uh, antibacterial spray they were misting about themselves. And uh, that was overkill. Um, that was more than you would wear in a COVID unit. Uh, that is what I call you know, a phobia about germs. And then we see where people are afraid to eat if they're not in their home. Um, I saw a video uh, early on in the quarantine where there was a doctor who showed surgical sterile technique for how to unload your groceries. And um, just like you would keep operating instruments uh, clean. And there is no need to do that. Um, science is showing us that's not a vector for transmission. It's all about the aerosol. Um, but there are people that are um, treating it like that. And that is not helpful. Um, if you're working in a COVID unit, yes, you need to be much more careful and you need to follow the protocol. But if you're not in a COVID unit, then social distancing and wearing masks is good. It's good enough for us and using hand sanitizer. And you know, the thing that I'm recommending to all my patients is we need to follow good CDC and WHO guidelines and follow the science. And we learned now at this point, we don't have to worry so much about surfaces where early on they were giving, telling us we have more concern about surfaces. Um, and then the best treatment for someone getting a phobia of germs is exposure-based therapy, which we're gonna cover. Let's go to the next slide. Social anxiety, okay. This is where someone is afraid that somehow they're going to look awkward or foolish or just feel like they're um, the center of everyone's attention. And I'm seeing this come up in several ways with the pandemic. So one is I'm um, having kids and adults who feel very embarrassed to wear a mask. And it's kind of like um, I've had socially anxious kids and adults where when they um, first get glasses, they feel like everyone's noticing me and it's so uncomfortable. Uh, or people are getting out of practice because they've been isolated and it feels good to be away from everyone because they're avoiding. And then now they're finding it hard to get back into the mix with people when they need to because they're feeling excruciatingly shy or like too much time has gone by since they've seen that person, what would they say? Um, or it feels awkward to talk to someone when all you can see is their eyes and what do you talk about? And um, we're seeing an increase in that. And, and it's a product of having less exposure, so that negative reinforcement is happening, or having to just do new behaviors that um, anything new would make this person feel uncomfortable. And so I have had some people where their kids have had tantrums or their teens have, refusing to wear masks when they ought to. And so we do exposure practice with that um, to try and help someone get over that. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, this one is just one about worry. And I was mentioning this earlier is we're seeing, this is probably one of the biggest things that we're seeing more of is just worry about what bad thing is gonna happen. And we see um, people who are worrying about everything because worry doesn't have to just be about the pandemic it can be the election it can be the economy what's happening to your job and we get worried about worry when someone can't stop it and when someone starts to believe that it's actually useful and necessary and it's interrupting their sleep making them sore making them feel sick and the truth is 
the doctor most likely to see a worrier is a sleep disorders clinic or a GI clinic where someone is having stomach disturbance or upset or eye, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and it turns out they're just worried. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about exposure therapy because this is gonna be the biggie that's gonna be so helpful. Exposure therapy is where you are literally trying to get used to the situation that you're scared of. So I want you guys to imagine that you were taken to one of these amusement parks that had like the world's fastest and steepest roller coaster and you didn't like roller coasters and you had to get on it for the first time. My guess is we could get you to have some incredible panic attacks, scream bloody murder, maybe even wet your pants so you would be so scared. Well, what happens after you ride it 10 times, 20 times, 40, 50, 70, 80, 90, 100? Well, we know what will happen, and this happens to all people and all animals, is you do what we call habituate. You get used to it. And because the receptors for the fear chemicals in your brain get saturated after about 90 seconds of being stimulated, they have to downregulate. And that means if you keep riding the roller coaster over and over, even though you're anticipating it with fear, your body's gonna go, this isn't so bad. I'm not so anxious. And your mindset starts to change and it becomes boring. Well, this is what we try to do and what I and my staff do all day with anxious people is we do exposure therapy where we take the things that they're scared of and we figure out how can we get someone to practice facing that situation without avoiding, without freezing, or without um, trying to fight. Because one of the most common symptoms of anxiety in children is headaches, tummy aches, and saying, um, and having tantrums and saying, I don't want to do something. And a lot of, and one of the problems I've seen when I've worked with um, cyclic vomiting patients is oftentimes the parents are over-diagnosing cyclic vomiting and assuming all stomach upset and headaches are cyclic vomiting, when many times it's anxiety. And so this means that you're going to have to learn to be like the Marine sergeant. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Let's say you had to be a soldier and you're in the middle of a battle and there's rockets and bullets and grenades coming at you everywhere. Which Marine Sergeant do you want? Do you want the one that says, aim your weapon and fire, pull your pin and throw the grenade? Or do you want the one that says, oh my God, this is so scary. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I get panic attacks too. You know, I, I pooped in my pants the first time I was in one of these things, but you know, after about 20, you'll get used to it. Here, here let's hold hands and let's, um, you know, pray. Okay, we're going to make it. Well, the second one is actually the way that most parents handle their children's fear. They over-accommodate and they prevent opportunities for exposure and for the child's body and brain learning, I can handle fear. I can handle this difficult situation. And we believe that over-accommodation style of parenting over the past 30 years is one of the um, larger risk factors for why anxiety and depression has gone up in the age 35 and younger population. So this means that for yourself or for your kid, you're gonna have to become that Marine Sergeant that says somehow, some way, we've gotta face the situations that we fear. If I'm scared of germs, it means I got to get out of my house and I got to walk around and I need to touch stuff and not instantly douse myself in hand sanitizer um, or try and figure out how many other people have touched this who have coughed. If, if it means I'm afraid of public restrooms or using them in public, uh, when we're you know, at a mall because I'm scared, because it's closed in of all the molecules that might be in there, I need to go in there with a mask and I need to use it. If it means that I'm scared to go to the hospital and I really do need to see the doctor, I've got to go and I have to trust that they're following proper protocol of separating the COVID risk area from the general medical area. And it means that if I'm dying of loneliness, I have to form a pandemic pod and trust that others are going to respect 
the rules that we set for each other in terms of maintaining safety. And it means you have to do this over and over. So with my son who was scared to go back to school, we would practice driving and getting there several times a day over a week. And then I literally dragged him out of the car at his middle school and we walked him in, even though he was crying and shaking and saying, what if I poop? What if I vomit? What if I poop? What if I vomit? And then we have to talk like the Marine Sergeant. And by that, I don't mean the yell at someone, but I need to mean the talk with confidence. So you need to be saying to yourself or to your child, it looks like you're just scared. This is just anxiety. Of course you're anxious. You haven't been doing this. You haven't had practice. You've been quarantined. Um, you've been isolated. You've watched too much social media. You've heard too much catastrophic news. Um, and of course it's tough, but you can do it. I know you can do it. And so you don't get sucked up in trying to comfort. You matter-of-factly accept the anxious moment and encourage the next step. And so if you feel like you're getting stuck or your kid's getting stuck, instead of leaving, you want to say, what's the next eighth of a step I can take? What's the next teeny thing I can do to lean into this fear and to press in so that I can reclaim my life and live more comfortably? So let's go to the next slide. We have to become people who take risks. Only we don't want to do foolish risks. So you can, this was one of those pictures taken in Florida when we had all these, um, you know, 20 somethings and late teens going to the beach and helping to spread the pandemic in Florida. And reasonable risk taking is different than foolish risk taking. And so right now, the reasonable risks that we should all be taking is getting together with pandemic pod people, shopping, seeing people outside. Um, being outdoors, enjoying uh, the weather, uh, trying to do all our normal activities um, as best we can, as opposed to just staying indoors and um, not being around any people. And we have to trust that the social distancing and our mask um, is good enough. And we have to live that way. And then if it's not COVID that someone's having trouble with, then we need to help the person do those things that would you would normally want to do because this is going to go on for a long time and we're all discovering now we have to find a way to live with covid and to embrace the risk and to live well so for example i do my normal shopping i just wear a mask and i use hand sanitizer when i get into my car um, i eat outdoors at restaurants now because it's so nice to go out and to not cook um, on occasion i have People come to my house in small groups and we hang out on the patio and then with my, um, I'm calling it my, you know, pandemic pod, then we, we don't worry about masks and we're sort of like there's a group of 10 of us where we're sort of family from my church. Uh, and we have that as part of our life and it feels so much better than what I did the first six weeks. So you've got to embrace risk and realize there is no such thing as taking away all risk here. You need to have, create and put the risks in favor of good mental health as opposed to extreme um, live in a bubble kinds of ways of living. Let's go to the next slide. I wanna mention one thing here. Um, if you are a medical professional, you've had specialized training in disease prevention. And the truth is it doesn't apply to the rest of us unless we're in some special high risk category. And that means um, that we do not have to do the kind of extreme hazmat suit stuff that people are doing. And I, I've had some patients who are physicians with anxiety disorders, and they're arguing that um, you have to wear a, she a face shield and a mask and hair covering and shower frequently. If someone sneezes, you should wash your face. You should always wear glasses because what if particles get to you? And I would argue, unless you're working on a COVID unit or in an ER where you're potentially running into COVID patients, you do not need to live that way. Or if you are a chemo patient and have some kind of uh, immunocompromised system, yes, you need to be that careful. But for the rest of us, it doesn't apply. And I just want to make that point. We don't need the sterile safety of an operating room in order to live well and to live safely. Let's go to the next slide. 
So your secret to success here, and I'm going to talk about the positive stuff, is you have to be willing to face fear, embrace risk, and you have to create positive mental health. And those are two different things because exposure therapy and embracing risk and living with risk is going to get rid of anxiety, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to live well. So let's go to the next slide. And part of what you're doing when you're doing exposure therapy that's worth mentioning, and we think this is actually the more critical part in terms of mental health, is you're learning that your mind can handle the experience of feeling afraid. And so you want to look at exposure therapy, not so much as I'm learning to do going to the grocery store, I'm learning to do hanging with friends, or I'm learning to do other stuff, is you want to look at it as I'm learning to manage my fear and the feeling of fear and the anticipation of getting scared, and I'm learning I can handle it. And I have this slide here is because we have people in our population that have what we call the thrill factor or the T factor. And they're the opposite of people with anxiety disorders. Um, no one in my family has ever been born this way. They're the ones that seek out extreme sports, that like climbing without ropes, um, doing those kinds of things. They join the Navy SEALs. They think it's a cool idea. Um, they're not us, but um, they've shown us that you can learn to enjoy that experience or at least not be traumatized by it and just go, this is ordinary and normal. Of course, there's times where I'm going to feel anxious. Let's go to the next slide. The next two things I'm going to talk about are very, very powerful. And I'm sure you've heard about gratitude. I know that if I go to Target, you can see gratitude journals or you see posts online. And it's become trendy for a reason. There's over 15,000 studies on the positive mental health impact of gratitude. And gratitude is something very specific. It's where you have a moment of appreciating and recognizing that you are the lucky, blessed recipient of a good experience that you didn't deserve, that it just came your way, and you're feeling pleasure at acknowledging that. And the mistake that a lot of people make with gratitude is they either uh, think about it in too general a term, you know, so like at Thanksgiving, where you all thank God for the nation, for your being alive, um, for the great meal. And then actually we're talking about a daily awareness of what's good about that day and what's great that's coming to you. And we see that gratitude is actually a core um, component of a healthy personality. And we consider it the mother skill for good mental health. And so when um, they've done research, they found gratitude is so powerful that if you get someone to write down three things a day that are specific to that day that they feel grateful for, in 30 days, you can alleviate depression. You can gra greatly decrease anxiety. You can be really helpful. And we've seen that people who have um, optimism and grit and who've survived very difficult things are people who easily feel grateful. And so if there's any skill that I want to give my kids, it's the skill of gratitude. And so here's how I recommend that you do this. So number one, we see that writing it down or speaking it out loud to someone works better than typing it. And there's, we think the reason for that is you process it more deeply. And it has to be specific. So I can um, do gratitude right now. I can say, you know, gosh, I'm so glad that my chair is so comfortable, that it's so beautiful outside that when I look past my screen, I see this incredible blue and white fluffy clouds. And I'm grateful you're all here listening to me and interested in improving your mental health. Um, those kind of things are the things you want to write down. And you uh, want to do it no matter what your mood is. It's more powerful when you're having a tough day. Um, so if you're having a very difficult day, a bad bout of vomiting or um, abdominal migraine or head migraine, you really need to do this and you need to dig deep and figure out what it is. And so I tell my patients, you know, it doesn't matter what, that every 24 hours you've got to write this down or tell someone out loud. The other advantage of writing it down is you can go back and reread your gratitude. And what we see happens inside your brain when you're recording or talking about gratitude is you release dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin if it's about other people. And those hormones decrease inflammation, 
they increase positive mood, and they're associated with just feeling better. They're good things. The dopamine is a thing that people are oftentimes chasing when they're trying to get high. And here you can do it all by yourself. Well, I've been doing this for about 13 years now, um, keeping journals. I have a whole shelf full. And uh, one of the ways I did this with my family is when they, starting very young, part of our grace would be you have to say something you're thankful for on that day. And you weren't allowed to get away with just coming up with some answer like, um, you know, I'm just thankful uh, for God. Um, it'd be you had to think of something that you're grateful for. Um, and then also, when my kids would have rough times, I'd also say, hey, what are some things you can be grateful for right now? And I'd always kind of wondered whether or not I was having an impact. And cyclic vomiting actually helped me see that my kids were getting a skill down. So with my oldest, we were in the emergency room at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, and it was one of those typical cyclic vomiting moments where he was so dehydrated, no one could get a line into his arm, and everybody's poking him. And then finally, of course, they go and they get the person from the NICU that works with little bitty babies, and they get this in. And my son the whole time is um, dry heaving and looking, you know, typical cyclic vomiting awful. And they got it in and they started the medicine. He started to feel better. And I expected him, he was a seventh grade at the time, to turn to me and to say some pretty ugly, um, colorful things about how long it had taken to get this line in. And he shocked me. He goes, Mom, aren't you glad they could get the line in and that medicine could get in me? And I, I started crying. I was so happy at what this meant in terms of my son's resilience. And then I had a similar thing happen with my youngest son. And this time we were doing some new protocol where every eight hours you infuse some medicine uh, that would make him violently ill um, for about half an hour where he'd vomit and vomit and vomit and feel awful. And the idea was after four days of this, it would somehow give him several months of cyclic vomiting free treatment. And right before the last treatment, his line infiltrated and they couldn't use it. And so they uh, had to find another line. And same thing happened. They couldn't find anything. Nothing was working. And this son was my real grumbler. He's always been the one who's most likely to yell loudly about things. And same thing. They ended up trying all these people, getting the you know, pediatric person in there. And they said, well, we've got a choice. We can do your foot or we can do your neck. And um, Anna says, do my neck. And they had trouble at first, and then they got it in. And then, you know, we did this treatment where he was barfing and barfing and barfing, and then it settled down. And I was waiting for him to just swear at me and give me the F-bomb. And he turned to me and he goes, Mom, I'm so glad this thing got in my neck because if they had put it in my foot, I don't know how I was going to pee without getting pee on it. And I was really happy then too, going, oh my God, you know, this kid, this is amazing. My kid has the ability to be grateful in the worst of times and this is helping him cope. And so I'm giving you as those two things that you guys have probably experienced where when you are practicing this, it can make the moment less bad. Um, and there's a great movie, It's a Beautiful Life, I think Robin Williams is in it, where it's in a concentration camp and it illustrates the same principle. Um, so we have a family journal in the bathroom because everyone's there and people write in it. And we do it at the dinner table. Um, we do it at special holidays. And then I also spontaneously share what I'm grateful for to be a good role model. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. This is really great. Oh gosh, I'm so glad this restaurant does such a great job of guacamole. And I've seen that my kids have picked it up without me having to make it some kind of special therapeutic prog uh, you know, process for them. So I'm gonna challenge you to develop some gratitude. And then we're gonna talk about the last positive mental health skill that you're gonna be able to use. So next slide. And this one is good humor. And I know many of you have felt like since you realized you had cyclic vomiting, like what's there to laugh about? Well, honestly, there's a lot. So, and there's a lot of research behind good humor. And what I mean by good humor is the ability to see the absurdity in the situation, in yourself, 
and in others and to enjoy it and laugh at it. I do not mean sarcasm. Sarcasm is a way to express anger and it's not actually um, a mentally well form of humor. So I'm not talking about sarcasm. So here is a fun fact question. What produces the same amount of dopamine release in your brain, that feel good hormone, that 20 minutes of mindful meditation does. It's a laugh. A fake laugh will even do the same thing. So if you go, ha 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 ha, like they do in yoga um, laughing classes or laughing yoga, whatever they call it, um, you get the same positive effect. And we have seen also that laughing decreases pain. It decreases pain perception and it helps release some endogenous opiates besides releasing dopamine and oxytocin. And so you want to cultivate your funny and you want to cultivate your kids funny even when things seem like they're the worst. And that's including with the pandemic. And one thing I loved during the early part of the quarantine is all these people doing funny songs about being quarantined, about not working, about um, hand washing, uh, you name it. It was, it was such a gift to us all. And my, that's one thing I do with my family is we all try to find funny videos that we send to each other. And one thing you can do is you can pick a topic each week, like hamsters and saying, who finds the best funny hamster video? Who has the best funny barf video to play with cyclic vomiting? Who has the best funny video about um, horses? And one I'd encourage you to look up is a horse playing um, a flute. And there is this hilarious video where someone shoves a recorder up a horse's nostril and uh, fingers it while this horse blows out and they do Mary had a little lamb and it is priceless. It makes me laugh every time. And so the way you can cultivate humor is by reading funny things, watching funny things, avoiding social media and um, negatively skewed news, and then asking yourself the question, what happened today that's funny? And it's a matter of learning to pay attention to it. And so I would encourage you to ask your partner, um, your child, a different question than what happened today or what happened to school is to ask them instead, what's the funniest thing that happened to you today? Or what's the funniest thing that happened to you this week? And what I love about asking that question is um, invariably you learn some really funny stuff and you get a much more enjoyable conversation going than you do in terms of, you know, what did you learn today or what happened at work or, you know, et cetera. So that's um, what I have for you now, and I'd love to uh, take your questions and see what we can do to try and help you out. But I want you to remember, do exposure, embrace risk, socialize, up your gratitude, up your good humor, and that is going to put you in a really mentally well place. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cassidy. That was some great information. Um, so I'm actually going to ask a question that I get a lot um, yeah. working for CVSA, and that is, what type of therapist is good for working with someone who has CVS? Yeah, the, um, there's two types that I would look for. So one um, is called a behavioral medicine specialist. And this would be um, a master's or doctoral level therapist who has specific training in dealing with the mental health aspects of having uh, medical uh, or neurological disorders, you know, such as cyclic vomiting. And so they would be much more likely to know about cyclic vomiting or to easily learn about it and feel comfortable with it. And um, also people who specialize in working with pain. Um, uh, you know, pain management, uh, and both these groups are accustomed to using um, exposure approaches to, you know, help children and help adults who suffer from that. And then the other group are going to be people who specialize in anxiety disorders. And if you go to the Anxiety Disorders Association of America, so ADAA.org, um, you can easily find people throughout the world. Um, and then also, the International OC Foundation, 
I-C-O-F dot org that um, other people are trained and usually people or say always people who work with OCD work with all the other anxiety disorders. It's more a, a facet of um, a marketing strategy. Uh, and those, those three groups are going to be people that um, are familiar with this and have worked with kids that have cyclic vomiting or um, chronic pain or chronic medical illnesses or um, physical conditions that you know, are comorbid with anxiety. And so this is not going to feel strange to them. If you go to someone who's just a generalist, um, then I wouldn't recommend it because not only will cyclic vomiting seem unbelievable, a lot of times the way they interpret things, they are much more likely to think there's secondary gain, that someone's doing this to avoid something, um, as opposed to the problem is the disorder. Uh, you know, and that's certainly what happened to me. I, um, I actually got misunderstood as having Munchausen syndrome when I was in the ER once with my son and the resident had not read the chart on record, didn't know the diagnosis and they were interviewing me for Munchausen's and I was just furious. Uh, you know, Munchausen's is where, by proxy, is where someone's trying to induce a medical problem in their child to get attention. Um, you know, so you want to go to people where this, this is going to seem like a, something that's within their uh, wheelhouse and they're comfortable working with it. Thank you. That's, um, that's good information because that is definitely something uh, a lot of people are looking for uh, with CVS. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, yeah. we have the doctor's list, but we don't really have the mental health piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the Society for Behavioral Medicine um, is another place you can go on internet where it would have therapists who are trained in the behavioral medicine. So I forgot about the SBM, Society for Behavioral Medicine, and they list people who work with disorders such as this. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, next question. Um, so it says, when my son gets an episode, I freeze. I feel so bad for him that I am unable to function as normal. I cannot separate myself from the situation and feel completely anxious. It is hard to watch him in pain. My husband seems to go about his normal day knowing that the episode will end. I'm unable to do so. Any tips on how I should best react? Yeah, um, what you're describing is not uncommon. And I have worked with quite a few parents where, where this is a big problem for them where either um, seeing the vomiting you know, so that is, is just freezes them um, or just seeing the agony or hearing the moans. And, and so here's some suggestions. Number one, you need to take the exposure therapy approach because when you're stuck in that freezing or avoiding and you have your husband or someone else handle it, you're never going to develop mastery over your fear. And you can do this in several ways. So one would be to have your um, husband videotape your son when he's sick. And then to have you practice watching these videotapes first with the sound off and while you're watching it, instead of trying not to watch it, to look at it and then to say something different to yourself. And I want you to say something like this, which is, um, I know he's in pain, but he needs to see my courage and my coping so he can learn to cope. And this isn't the worst thing that could happen. Yes, it's unpleasant and life is never fair, but it's just feeling sick. His life isn't at stake, you know, in other words, his health isn't threatened, it's just this incredibly unpleasant moment. And since I can't change that this happening, the best thing I can do is to help him cope. And then I want you to try and slow down your breathing with your mouth closed and to breathe as slowly as you can through your nose so that you don't accidentally create a panic attack by over exhaling carbon dioxide and to watch. And then when you can do that more comfortably and remind yourself this is unpleasant, but it's not life threatening. My son needs my courage um, and he knows that I love him. I don't have to show him more empathy or sympathy. I'm gonna learn how to be a marine surgeon. I would gradually turn up the sound. And then what I would do is I'd try to do the same thing when your husband's assisting your son. I want you to try and stand at a distance and watch and keep trying to get closer and then get to where you can have your hand on your son's shoulder while your husband might be helping him vomit or helping clean up or you know whatever they're doing. Um, but I want you to do the opposite of looking away and avoiding and not hearing. 
and, and you're going to have to be tough on yourself um, because you're going to make it worse for yourself if you run away. And then the thing I hear from kids who have parents who do this freeze response or who cry when they get really upset is they misinterpret it as, wow, something must really be bad. And what they really need is someone who can just direct them to getting through the next moment, um, but who's not caught up with, um, you know, over empathizing and, um, you know, feeling undone by it. So that would be my suggestion. And then you could also watch videos of people who are suffering and do the same thing. And if you think about it, this is what physicians and nurses do. And this is what mental health professionals do. It's because our natural normal instinct is to feel other people's pain. But we soon learn if we wanna be effective, we have to be like that ER doc who instead of screaming, oh my God, I can't believe how much that bone is sticking out. You want them to say, well, we've got this one, we've done this before. Um, I know this is gonna be painful, but we're gonna get you out of this. And that's the, the dialogue I want you to learn to have. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, this is kind of multiple questions from one person. Um, mm -hmm. I'll read the first couple, some of them. Um, well, I'll just let you decide how to answer. Um, what? what is the best treatment for a five-year-old with CVS? Which medical professionals should be involved in his care? Um, and then medication was another question. Those are the first couple, and I'll ask the other ones. Okay, um, I am a PhD clinical psychologist, not a medical physician. So I'm not able to speak on you know, medications, but what I can tell you is typically, it's going to be a gastroenterologist um, or a neurologist who's going to have the training to work with cyclic vomiting. And I know if you contact the CVSA, they can help you find experts in your area. Um, I'm seeing now that um, more gastroenterologists are getting training in cyclic vomiting, and it's not like this mysterious unknown thing that it used to be. And then, um, you know, the, the thing that I think would be important for you is right now you can help your doctor by keeping records and keeping a log of when your child has an episode what exactly happens in an episode, what's the sequence of symptoms they have, um, what was happening the day before, um, how long did it go on, um, et cetera, et cetera, because that can help them start to hone in because there are subtypes of cyclic vomiting that have some different medication strategies uh, and treatment strategies for that. So that's the best I can say, but I think the CVSA is gonna be able to help you out more than I am. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Karen. Um, and then uh, more of her question was asking about your kids. Um, do they still deal with CVS? And if not, what, what age did it change? Yeah, for, for both my boys, um, they had, in, in hindsight, anytime they would um, get overly stressed, you know, we'd have a week of vomiting when they were younger. But for both of them, it's when they hit puberty and had a growth spurt, it went haywire. And um, both of them missed a lot of school, one ended up with a backpack IV and it was very difficult um, for both kids for about two years. And then um, for both of them, uh, by the first, and for my oldest and second year of high school, um, it went dramatically down um, and that's when they were growing less. And then for both of them, I'd say by age 18, it got to where, uh, for my 19-year-old, um, he only can get, or gets, if he gets really tired, he can get some abdominal migraines, but he doesn't mind that. He looks at that as like, that's nothing compared to what I used to have. And then with my oldest, we don't have episodes anymore. We just have to be careful if he gets really sick. And then he might get a headache and some nausea, but he doesn't go into an episode. And I'm so thankful for that. So I was very fortunate. They both outgrew it. Um, and that's, you know, greatly. And I know for myself, if I don't take CoQ10, then if I get overtired, I start to get abdominal migraines. And I found, you know, for me, and this is something Dr. Lee uh, taught me, uh, and my sons take it, is that has uh, made a big difference for me. Thank you for sharing all the personal stuff too. What kind of anxiety therapy works best for a five-year-old? Um, Actually, it doesn't matter what age your kid is. We work with kids as young as age two. 
exposure therapy works best. And the fun thing with little kids is you can turn it into exposure games. And so this morning I had a little five-year-old and she is scared of people crying. She just had to go to a funeral. And so we got pictures of people crying we, that she looked at and we'd have her cover her eyes and then look and do it until it wasn't so scary. We had her draw pictures of people crying and then we played a game where her parents and I pretended to cry um, and she pretended to cry. And then we got YouTube and we first looked at a silent screen where you could just see people crying on it. And, we, um, and, and actually with YouTube, you can get anything, any fear, you can find videos on it. It is an amazing tool and you can also get pictures from images. And so with kids, we use pictures, we use cartoons, drawing it. And then we made up stories about uh, people who every single pet they had died and they all cried and cried and cried and had to go to a funeral. And by the end of an hour and a half, um, she was able to laugh and look at these things and not feel so scared and, um, and be comfortable with her father's grief. Uh, and so literally, you know, if you're willing to do one long session, you can make a huge impact. The thing we know about anxiety disorders is the earlier you intervene, the better. And so the mistake a lot of parents make is if they start seeing dribs and drabs of anxiety a couple of weeks here, your kid is constantly asking questions about something or refusing to do something or hiding when there's a tornado, then they don't do anything about it. We found the earlier you intervene, the less likely they are to develop it later on during puberty or adulthood, and they have less severe episodes when they do develop them. Um, and so it's trying to take the things that are difficult and having a game, and then we always give rewards to little kids. And so I ask them, what would you like to get or earn to guarantee that you can do your beat up the fear monster practice? And I have stuff like you can um, have treats, you can have special uh, time with mom or dad. Uh, you can play a game with no siblings interrupting. You get to sleep with the pet. Um, you can earn nickels or dimes or quarters. Uh, you can go to the, um, the store and get those bags of you know, little party gifts and have a bowl with those and they can pick one of those out. I used to recycle Happy Meal toys because uh, you know, the kids would forget about them and I'd put them in a bowl and then we could <laughs> use those as something uh, you draw out when you have a young kid. And so it's, it's exactly the same. And that's what's interesting is we find the same treatment I use with a 90 year old works with um, a toddler. Uh, you know, and then I found out from my veterinarian, they do exposure therapy with dogs that have fears and it works the same way. <laughs> <laughs> we all are a little similar. Yeah. Um, this is a good one. Is treatment different if anxiety causes CVS versus CVS causes anxiety? No, it isn't. And, and this is where I guess you have to be kind of like that Marine sergeant is because I've had patients with heart disease where we've had to do things that create symptoms that feel like, you know, I'm having cardiac symptoms. Um, if someone is afraid of physical symptoms, and I've had this with some CVS patients, then what we do is we um, have them drink a bunch of soda and jump up and down so they get super full and fizzy and feel a little nauseous. And we do that practice over and over until they realize just because I have tummy sensations doesn't mean I'm going to have CVS. Um, and, and it means you have to be willing that to possibly risk having an episode um, so with those patients, I just have a plastic lined uh, trash basket handy and some paper towels. And what we're trying to indicate to the kid is the biggest tragedy in your life is not living your life well. It's not cyclic mm -hmm. vomiting. And the, the thing I wanted my children to learn from my attitude was, although I, you know, it's unfortunate that you have cyclic vomiting, we can't change it. It's like you're blue eyes or how tall you are or your red hair. Um, and the best you can do is learn that life can still be beautiful and worth living, even though you've got to deal with this. And that is the ultimate best mental health strategy. And uh, so I would still do exposure. The thing I do is I try to graduate the exposure and figure out what are the 
smallest, tiniest steps I can take to build up this child or this adult's confidence about this exposure technique working and work up to the difficult thing. And what's so interesting when I've had people with cyclic vomiting or with irritable bowel disorder, they're afraid I'm going to have explosive diarrhea is we've never actually ended up having vomiting or diarrhea induced. Um, even when we're doing stuff where we're trying to create the sensations and make it seem like it. And so I have um, fake vomit here at my office. I have vomit flavored jelly beans from Jelly Belly that you can order on the internet. And we use those when people are really scared of vomiting or the tack and showing them, even when you create that flavor, you see the big yucky plastic splatty, or we, we pretend to vomit, we get um, oatmeal with frozen peas and carrots and green food coloring and mix it up and put it in our mouth and then you know, pretend to vomit into the trash can, I, we've not been able to provoke an actual episode, uh, which is very interesting. And so you wanna reverse that whole mindset in yourself and your kid that says, don't go too close to that thing that makes you anxious. Um, learn that you can lean into it, you can embrace it, and the worst that will happen is that you get anxious. Lots of good advice. What can a spouse do to help chronic daily severe uh, CVS patient? Oh, um, is the question like, what would a, be helpful in a partner? To... I, yes, I think that's what they're asking. Okay, so when we look at research on what really helps people when they're in really difficult times, and this is from several areas, looking at grittiness, at coping, at whatever, we see a couple of common traits. So one is we see empathy. So the person is able to identify the emotional state someone's feeling. So being able to say, oh, it looks like you're having a rough cyclic vomiting day. We see optimism. And I don't mean unrealistic optimism. I mean something that states a realistic, authentic thing about this too shall pass. Because what's tough when you're in the middle of a CVS episode is it feels eternal. And that's where you remind the person who's suffering saying, look, I know this is really rough. It's a tough CVS moment, but you're going to get through it. And I know it's going to pass. And so they express optimism and temporariness about the situation. And that's even if the person is saying, but I've had this for so many years, it's never going away. Like, yeah, I know that's the way it is, but this episode isn't permanent. And then we also see that this person puts the attention on microscopic steps of coping. So if you think about, like if you're in the middle of a marathon and someone's you know, trying to encourage you, um, which feels better? And someone says, you have made so many steps, just take the next one, you're gonna get there. Or, well, you're at mire marker 12 and you have another 14.6 miles to go, okay? <laughs> The second one is demoralizing. So you point out, hey, you've made it through so many episodes before. You've made it through the worst first five minutes. You're gonna get through this. You just have to be still here and let the lights be low, or you have to you know, um, take your suppository or uh, take a teeny sip of water, um, you know, whatever it is that the instructions are from your physician on what's helpful and just focus on that. And we've seen when people do that, that's important. And then the other thing is don't feel sorry for them. Because one thing I hear from um, kids and adults is they hate it when other people give them you're such a tragedy in their approach. They feel like I have a life, I have dignity. And when I worked on a terminally ill cancer patient's units years ago, the thing they would complain about is everybody's mournful face and they're going, I'm still alive, I wanna live. And that was what my sons both hated is when people would go, oh, I'm so sorry for you, or that's so awful, or that really sucks, is they wanted to have a conversation about normal things. They wanted to be treated like you're part of the world too. And so that means be willing when they can to live life to the hill and enjoy it and not do this mournful retrospection or feel sorry for them. Instead, um, realize they have dignity. They need you to show them how to cope. They want you to cope side by side, but they don't want your pity. And so those are my suggestions. That's very good advice. 
Um, okay, I think we have time for maybe one more last question. Um, yeah. I have a hard time. Sorry, I lost part of it here. Okay, I have a hard time telling the difference between proper risk mitigation and going to extremes. I have a medical condition that requires immune suppressing meds and my hubby is a cancer survivor. I mostly feel okay about my choices for risk mitigation, but hubby thinks I'm a little extreme. Is there a rule of thumb for finding that balance when there is extreme adverse outcomes from COVID risk? Yeah, and because um, this one has actually come up a lot at my practice because one thing you gotta remember is some physicians have anxiety disorders and, <laughs> and they take a, I'm not gonna try and take any risk. And so what I um, recommend to my patients is, you know, two things. One is uh, to try and determine what is your physician's general approach to risk taking? Are they, uh, you know, eliminate every possible risk or are they someone that realizes no matter what we do, we can't completely control whether or not you have contact with you know, COVID droplets. And in fact, we now know that it's, it seems like it's a quantity or a dose effect in terms of getting it. And so the assumption is probably all of us are every now and then coming into contact with some aerosolized uh, COVID. It's more do we get a blast of it. And so my rule for patients is, is what you're doing allowing you to live a mentally well and physically well life. So are you able to get out? Are you able to be around people? Are you able to do things that you need to do to live well? So that's number one. Number two, is it the kind of thing that physicians in general recognize? So I know on CDC and WHO, they do have guidelines for people like you, if you're immunocompromised, if you have diabetes, that you need to follow more precautions than the rest of us. Um, the problem that I see most people getting into trouble with is when they start improvising and adding uh, and doing extra things, or they assume that the people around him who are improvising are somehow putting them at risk. And I want you to think of it this way, which is you may need to wear a face shield and a mask and gloves when you go to the grocery store and your husband or your partner may feel like, you know, since cancer is behind me, I'm not feeling like I have to go to that extreme. A face mask is enough for me and I'll wash my hands when I get home. Is the mistake would be to say, I can't be around that person um, because they don't have COVID. Uh, and they did adequate, you know, social distancing and protective measures. So the idea is don't add, find out what physicians in general recommend or what is the common standard for your particular risk category and don't demand that everyone else do exactly like you do um, because you're doing it to protect yourself. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I think that um, that will do it for today. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about mental health in these unprecedented times. And for everyone else, thank you for participating. And we look forward to bringing you some more virtual speakers. We have some more coming up in the next few months. Everyone have okay. a good afternoon. Bye -bye, thank you.